Thank you. And I see a lot of familiar names. So please um, use your reactions and send a wave. I see Steven and Karina and Igor. And um, I know I'm missing some because I can't see all the screens. But nice to see you. I'm looking forward to a little bit of a, a, a memory lane of um, when I started preparing this talk, thinking about my very enjoyable time at uh, UBC. I'm just getting my slide um, in the right format. Okay. Now, can someone confirm that they see my slides? Yes. Yes, I can see it. And is the video showing up on yours as well? Uh, which, which video? So on, on my screen, I see the panel with the videos. Does, does that show up on yours? No. Okay, good. I wasn't <laughs> sure if that was something going to show on everyone. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, today I'm going to be talking about the impact of the specificity of exposure metrics and epidemiologic studies and some of the lessons I've learned um, at UBC and over the course of my career studying this. Um, first, I wanna give a little bit of context for my work because it, it's a little bit of a niche field in the occupational hygiene world. Um, I specifically work on exposure assessment um, for epidemiologic studies and almost exclusively for um, outcomes of cancer with a little bit of work in, for other chronic diseases. And what's really unique about this is that we are looking to characterize exposures over a multi-decade period. Most of these studies are, um, are retrospective as a result the exposures occur 10 to 60 years older. And we often have a lot of missing information. One of the questions I get a lot and I like to address right up front is, you know, why don't we just use measurements? And I want to mention that for, in, for this particular purpose, that our measurements are often an alloyed gold standard. They don't always measure the target compound. They may be area versus personal samples. And this may not be such a problem in, in today with, with better um, research sampling designs, but this is a feature of many of our historical studies. Or samples might be task versus full shift. They may use different sampling strategies that may not be representative of the day-to-day the -day exposures we're interested in. And over time, we've got a lot of issues with changing strategies and methods. And overall, we have a lot of gaps. And in this context is the work that I do. And I started this way back in my master's degree. I started at UBC in, in a master's program in 1999. And my master's thesis, and I'll talk a little bit about today. Um, but in preparing for my thesis, I stumbled across this quote that has resonated with me my entire career. And it's a quote from Patricia Stewart in one of her classic papers that really set the foundation for the work that I did. Historical exposure assessment requires an opportunistic approach, taking advantage of what information is available and developing creative and innovative approaches to exploit that information. But you know, when I was preparing my, my slides for this talk, I realized that all of these studies and the case studies I'm gonna be presenting today have many common components. And while all of it, it, my case studies are related to the specificity of exposure, which is my title, um, I'm gonna emphasize those common components. I'm gonna talk about three different case studies wood dust in the BC sawmill workers cohort, metal working fluids in two different studies, and endotoxin and bioaerosol exposure in a farming cohort. The title for my talk today really comes from one of the papers of my doctoral dissertation. And you may recognize some of these names. I know Hugh Davies is in the audience today. Um, 
and Kay Teschke and Paul Demers are our former faculty um, at UBC. Um, Alec Ostry and Clyde Hertzman were in the epidemiology department. The, in that paper, I presented the, the findings of analyses conducted on COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease hospitalizations and wood dust exposure. And this was conducted in a subset of the BC sawmill worker cohort. And just thinking back, when I was a grad student at UBC, many, many of us masters and PhD students were getting our thesis work out of the BC sawmill cohort. So I'm not unique in that. And I think a little bit about the next sentence where you know, the outcome here was COPD hospitalizations. And this was made possible by some of the early work done to link hospital discharge records to um, um, the B I, now that I've been out of BC, I don't remember all the, the technical terms, but basically your medical insurance number. And so I think Chris McLeod was uh, your speaker last week, and I know he was working on many of the, the early steps and continuing on with, with this work. Um, but the, when I was working on the COPD hospitalizations, it was really early data, I believe. Anyways, back to the findings of this study, what, what we found was that dust was not associated with COPD hospitalizations in this cohort, but wood dust exposure was. So that's the punchline. But what I want to focus in today is how did we get those wood dust metrics? Because when we measure exposure, dust is a nonspecific measure. So I'm sorry, I'm just having to move uh, the video across, it's blocking my text. So apologize for the delay there. Okay, so how did we do the wood dust exposure assessment? Well, this is the work of many people and a lot of this work was done before I even started. Um, so uh, I wanna acknowledge that this is, a, a lot of this design came from the people who mentored me. The first component and that I, I see in, in many of the studies that I've worked on um, since then was to go out and collect study specific measurements. And I suspect that Hugh Davies will still remember the many weeks and months he spent at the many different sawmills collecting these measurements. And you, I'm sure you can ask him about those. He went out with others and collected field study specific measurements of personal, personal inhalable dust. And they made sure to measure exposure across all jobs and exposure scenarios, because many of the measurements that had been collected historically didn't cover all areas of the small sawmill. A key piece of the wood dust assessment was a sub-study um, to look at the target agent of interest. As I mentioned, dust as a measured in the air is not, it's a non-specific particulate. And the hypothesis was that it may be the wood dust specific component of the dust that might be associated with health outcomes. So there was a sub-study that was conducted to measure the abiotic acid concentrations of the wood dust or the, of the particulate um, collected on the filters. Now, abiotic acid is a a wood extractive can specific to softwoods. So it was used as a surrogate for the wood dust um, component. Now, then the study incorporated expert judgment. A team of researchers with industrial hygiene expertise went through all the jobs in the sawmill and classified them into one of four categories of potential wood dust exposure from minimal, low, moderate, and high. So an example of, of an area where the particulate would be expected to have a, a minimal um, amount of wood dust might be really early on in the process in, you know, in the log, pre-log processing, for instance. Whereas an example of low might be, um, during the log processing and high would be in the planers and where wood is getting cut. 
So, you know, a team of researchers assigned each job, and then they looked at the abiotic acid concentrations in each of these categories and looked at the relative difference compared to the group that was expected to have all the, all the measured dust was expected to be wood dust. And this allowed us to obtain um, adjustment factors for the relative proportion of wood dust. Um, and our adjustment factors were 10% if they were classified in the minimal or group one, 30% for the low group, 70% for moderate and 100% for high. Well, what's another component? Well, those field specific measurements were for a specific time and place and we were doing a historical cohort. So other researchers went out and found more measurements. They um, went and extracted all the historical dust measurements that they could from these sawmills at WorkSafe BC. At that time, it was the BC Workers' Compensation Board. They also had any company measurements, um, any uh, consultant measurements. And there are some publications out analyzing those data. To, then these were used to supplement and, and expand the exposure data set. Well, where I came in during my master's was to do some statistical modeling. And after all these years, I still can't say that word, even though it's the thing I do every day. Um, I uh, developed a statistical model to to look at the determinants of wood dust in the sawmill cohort, focusing in on determinants that we could, that we had available historically. So not focused in on how to, um, you know, modify exposure right now, but more about how did exposure vary across different work areas, across time, across coastal versus interior sawmills, um, across, you know, high production versus moderate versus low production um, facilities. And um, simultaneous, you know, researchers at UBC went out and extracted all those kind of um, time varying data and, and sawmill specific data um, from the 14 sawmills. Um, thinking back, I remember having to go through old records um, that were published about the production levels of each of these sawmills going back as far as possible. And all these components together allowed us to combine the statistical model with time varying and sawmill specific um, exposure estimates with um, the characteristics of the workplaces and the, and the jobs that each of the participants held to be able to develop wood dust specific metrics and that allowed us to identify that wood dust but not just generic dust was associated with COPD hospitalizations. Well and that leads us to our first poll question of the day. What sources of exposure measurements were used in the wood dust assessment? And Colleen if you put up the poll. Okay, um, and the majority is correct. And I think that's sharing both inspection and research. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to clear this, okay. Both inspection, both inspection and research measurements were used in this study. And the lesson I learned in this particular example beyond you know, looking at wood dust was to use all the information available to you and to recreate exposure. So 
my next case study is actually um, a tale of two studies that were specifically designed to answer the question about metal working fluids and cancer risk. Um, one of them was specifically designed to look at bladder cancer in particular, and then another was to look at a variety of um, cancer outcomes. And this is work that I, um, I was able to be part of during my postdoctoral work at the University of California, Berkeley, as well as on the tenure track at the National Cancer Institute. Now, the early evidence and the motivation for these studies was that there were over 20 epidemiologic studies that were implicating metalworking fluids as causing um, an increased risk of bladder cancer. Most of these analyses were based simply on surrogate measures of occupation. It was first noted in 1983 based on an excess risk in tool and dye workers, also in jobs in metal machining and machinists in the automotive industry. Some of these studies had crude metrics um, looking at exposure to oil mist or duration of exposure to um, oil mist or metal working fluids. So these two studies were designed to um, go beyond these metrics and look at it in a quantitative way. What are metal working fluids before I go on? They are, they are fluids used to cool, lubricate, and remove debris from surfaces of metal parts that are being drilled, ground, milled, or otherwise machined. Notably, there are three broad classes of metalworking fluids that have some components alike, but many that are different. Um, straight metalworking fluids contain petroleum oils that pre-1985 were almost always contaminated with polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs. Um, synthetic metalworking fluids has nitrites and alkan, I'm stumbling on my, for my words today, has a bunch of organic, or sorry, inorganic compounds um, that may also be associated with bladder cancer. And soluble metalworking fluids are um, kind of a combination of the two. They, they contain up to maybe 10 or 30% of petroleum oils, but also have some of the components of synthetic metalworking fluids. So the different types may have different risks. So the first um, study I wanna talk about is the United Auto Workers General Motors cohort. I'm gonna talk about a subset of nearly 22,000 male workers who um, I linked to cancer incidence data from Michigan for the time period in 1985 to 2004. It's an industry-based cohort with three different plants. Um, the exposure assessment predates me and, and was started in the, in the mid eighties, um, I believe led by Susan Waskey at UMass Lowell. Um, there was a specific exposure monitoring study, quite like the BC sawmill cohort study, where they went out and got metalworking fluid type specific estimates across all departments and jobs. They also extracted all the company measurements. Um, they had measurements as early as 1958. Um, they developed a statistical model, um, in particular, to get a time trend across these time periods and exposures decreased about 80 to 90% across the study. And they extracted work information from the General Motors company records. Um, however, they didn't have any information on exposure and jobs prior or post their work at General Motors. They had no covariate information such as smoking. But what was nice about the study was that these plants were, um, these factories were selected because they had minimal exposure to other agents and was pretty much exclusively looking at metal working fluids. Um, so during my postdoc, I analyzed the cancer incidence data for bladder cancer. Um, and this figure shows the results um, with a 20 year lag um, by metal working fluid type. In blue, you can see the results for straight metal working fluids, which was the only metal working fluid type that we saw um, in a dose response association with a trend um, p value of 0.02 and a risk in the highest quintile of exposure of 
On the far right is a smoothing spline um, of the dose response relationship for straight metal working fluid. But we found a, a flat association with soluble metal working fluid and no association with synthetic. Now the second study um, was the New England Bladder Cancer Study. And it's a quite a different study design than the two studies that I just talked about. It is a population-based case control study. It, um, this study, this analysis was restricted to the males. So I only put the male numbers in there. There was 895 cases and 1,031 controls. And we did have important subject specific covariate data such as smoking. But unlike the two previous studies, our occupational information did not come from the companies. They came from the subjects themselves. And the occupational questionnaires included a lot of detailed information. Metalworking fluids was an a priori exposure of interest. Um, so we had a lot of questions specific to that. First, there was a whole life occupational history. So we know what they did from their first job um, or any job that was longer than six months onwards. We also had really detailed questionnaire data for for specific jobs and industries. We had 66 unique modules and two thirds of the jobs reported by study subjects received one of these modules. Example questions in the modules that pertain to metalworking fluids kind of focused in on machining and making metal parts and types of machining equipment. And then they ask questions about how often do they use each of the three types of metalworking fluids referred to as their broad um, class type of straight, soluble and synthetic, but also by their visual description. So it look and feel like motor oil or oils that are milky white or that might be brightly colored such as green or blue. So the exposure assessment for the case control study it looks a little bit different. Um, one of the things that was done specifically in this um, study was to explicitly link the questionnaire responses to exposure estimates derived from a combination of approaches, including expert judgment, exposure measurements, and subjects reported information. And I refer to this approach as a decision rule framework. Um, we used a hierarchical data-driven approach where we directly used information from the study subject wherever possible. And we had a lot of information from the occupational questionnaires. So if a study subject reported that they used straight metal working fluid, we were pretty confident that we could say that the probability was 100% for that um, person in that particular job. And if they reported 10 hours per week of using straight metal working fluid, we used that as their frequency. Now, a subset did not get modules based on time constraints. We limited it to up to five modules per study subject, even if they reported more than five jobs. We also never asked the same module more than three times. So if they um, were changing employers, but doing similar work, we collected um, information through modules for their longest held jobs. So when that occurred for these jobs, we would use the job level averages that we derived from those in the first tier where we had complete data. So we, we were able to get data-driven, time-specific, um, and region-specific estimates um, to assign for, for these um, subjects. And then in a small number of cases, we did use um, the expertise of an um, industrial hygienist to assign um, exposure estimates. Um, in particular, this was done for farmers because there was no questions in their module about metalworking fluid, but we felt that there could be some potential from exposure during some of their engine repair um, and, um, and equipment repair work. Now that covered probability and intensity, sorry, frequency. 
But for intensity, we're, we're thinking about, okay, what is the exposure concentration? Um, this, we had to look for a new source of exposure measurements. In this case, the data was extracted from the published literature as summary statistics. And just um, wanna digress for a moment that this extraction of the data was done by um, Dunlop Park, who I first met when he was doing a visiting um, scholar appointment at UBC, which overlapped um, my um, doctoral research. So it was quite um, fun to be working with him um, remotely on this project um, later on when I, um, I joined NCI. So he, after UBC's at some point, he did a, a visiting scholar um, at NCI as well. So there was some overlapping work. I believe during his visiting scholar work at UBC, he was working with Kate Teschke and Susan Kennedy on um, metalworking fluids in, machine sh in small machine shops um, in BC. Um, so um, Dr. Park also developed a, st a statistical model of this published data. Um, and because these were summary statistics, he weighted each summary statistic by the number of measurements um, in that summary statistic. And he was able to extract decade industry um, operation, which is machining versus grinding um, and metalworking fluid type exposure estimates um, based on the published data. There were other variables in, in the model that are listed there that were not directly used to assign exposure in the study, but were used to um, try to calibrate the, the data across a, a wide range of um, measuring environments. And then this information was combined um, where we multiplied the intensity of um, exposure based on the statistical model by the uh, frequency reported by the study subjects or the group level averages and by the duration of time that that participant held that job, also including for um, time specific um, variability. So um, Joanne Cole, a colleague of mine at NCI, did the epidemiologic analyses for this and looked at risks for bladder cancer for the three metalworking fluid types. And once again, we saw the risk was exclusively in the straight metalworking fluid with a 2.2 fold increased risk in the upper tertile of exposure and a trend that was suggestive at um, 0.075. Now these analyses um, adjusted for smoking and employment and other high risk occupations for bladder cancer and exposure to other sources of mineral oils. Well, one of the things that I, I did after, you know, once the results from the New England bladder cancer study was, um, was published was to see, okay, well, let's put these two studies on the same scale, which was possible because both studies used a concentration um, scale in their exposure assessment. Um, and I was really struck by the similarity of the dose response for two very different studies with very um, you know, different study designs, cohort versus case control study, different sources of exposure measurements, company specific versus published data. Um, but we ended up showing for the first time that in a population-based case control study, we can replicate the high quality exposure assessment that, were, that used to be you know, isolated to the industry-based studies. So, so this was um, kind of a really remarkable day for, for us. One of those rare moments where you know, I, I did a figure and then ran to my branch chief's office who was the study PI and said, look, it replicates. Um, so that was a very um, exciting day in, in um, my tenure track life at NCI. Now my poll question for you now is what metalworking fluid was associated with increased bladder cancer risk 
We need a few more responses to get us over the hump. Are we stalled at 65%? Yes, I just closed the poll. Okay. Okay, so shall I go on? Okay, so share results. Please do. Okay. Um, so maybe I guess I wasn't as clear on this as I had hoped. Um, Though the majority did select straight metal working fluid, but it was straight metal working fluid was the only um, metal working fluid that we saw an increased risk with bladder cancer. And it points to my, my original uh, lesson and my title of my talk is the target analyte does matter in these studies. If we had treated metal working fluid as a homogen no, a homogenous class, we would not have seen this risk because it would have been attenuated. Okay. Um, for my last case study, I want to talk about biologically active dust, um, in particular endotoxin and, and work that we are doing um, in, the, in an agricultural cohort. And this is ongoing work. Our motivation for doing this work on endotoxin in a farming environment um, came from an analysis um, of 10 years ago by Lauren Bean Freeman that observed a decreased lung cancer risk in the agricultural health study with the increasing number of livestock or poultry in farmers. Um, and similarly, about five years ago, we saw that there were trends in immune marker levels with the increasing number of hogs. Um, you know, these two trends actually, you know, reminded me of work that George Strakinakis did in his doctoral research, which um, looked at endotoxin in textile workers. And endotoxin has been um, linked to a deficit of lung cancer risk in um, both uh, textile and farming environments. So, you know, is our surrogate measure, our number of animals in these two studies, implicating endotoxin or other bioaerosol um, components um, in the dust um, that the farmers may be exposed to. Now, bioaerosol exposure in farming can be very high and can be largely, you know, have large variability. Endotoxin is a component of cell walls of bacteria and fungi and glucans are uh, components of moles. And I mentioned glucans because our assessment did include glucans as well. And you know, from the lessons learned across the sawmills and the metalworking fluids and other studies I've been involved in, there really was a need to move from surrogates of exposure based on number of animals to quantitative endotoxin exposure estimates for our study. So what is our study? Well, the agricultural health study is a very large study of over 50,000 pesticide applicators that were enrolled in the mid 1990s um, in Iowa and North Carolina. Now, in a sub study of that is uh, the biomarkers of exposure and effects in agriculture or B the BS study. And it's a molecular sub, sub study with um, with blood samples and detailed questionnaire um, results for nearly 1,700 participants. And this study started shortly after I started at NCI and continued um, in accruals through 2018. And I was um, able to be involved in the questionnaire development of this study. Um, in the in 2015 and 2016, I led a small bioaerosol exposure monitoring study um, in a subset of the BS study it, in um, a subset of Iowa farmers. The bioaerosol monitoring study, you know, it reminds me of my first two lessons um, from the sawmill study, which is go out and get study specific data and um, to think about the target analyte. 
So we conducted 69 visits um, in 2015 and 2016 in the spring and the fall um, in 32 Iowa males. Um, and we collected both full shift and task-based samples, um, inhalable dust samples. And we analyzed those dust samples for, for just the non-specific dust via gravimetric analyses, as well as endotoxin and beta-1,3 glucan. Now these samples, it's a small study and we focused in on a gap in the literature, um, which was many of the crop related activities um, that were specific to the Iowa area that were, had limited measurements in, in the published data. But in and of itself, this study was not big enough to reconstruct our exposure. So we undertook um, an extensive um, effort to extract the published data from um, North American as well as um, European studies where we felt the exposure scenarios may be similar to the North American situation. And we use that to um, expand our, uh, our exposure database. As you can see in the blue text is our, in our Iowa field study. And you can see that our measurements represent only a fraction of the total data that we had available to us by going to the literature. Um, our study contributed 18% of the crop related measurements, only 2% of the livestock measurements and 19% of uh, measurements for other stored seed and grain work. And this was by design. We knew that the, the data for animal um, work was you know, well represented in the literature and we and our farmers were um, less likely to be doing that work or it was also challenging to get into um, some of those workplaces to, to, um, to do the measurements. Now, similar to the metal working fluid study, we had to synthesize all this data together but we used a different approach. Um, we analyzed the, the field study data and the published endotoxin data using a mixed effects meta regression model. And the benefit for this is not only did we adjust for the number of measurements for each summary statistic that was extracted from the literature, but also its exposure variability. So we adjusted by the inverse of, it, of the geometric standard deviation. Um, we first um, did this for a, a lead exposure assessment. Um, Dong He Ko and I um, did that first, um, or did that earlier, and we found the approach really worked, and it didn't require, um, you know, complicated simulations, and gave us similar results. Um, okay, so based on the meta regression model, we were able to extract and predict task, task specific endotoxin geometric means from this model. And you can see here, um, we have 12 tasks that I show. Um, the far left are two crop related tasks. The far right are two um, grain and seed related tasks. And in the middle are a range of animal related tasks. Our highest exposures came for endotoxin came for swine confinement, grinding feed, and poultry confinement. And I want to point out that the y-axis here is a log scale. So for every tick mark, it's a tenfold change in um, exposure. So animal um, work was often you know, two, um, two orders of magnitude higher exposure level than crop-related work. You can also see on the bottom that for some of these tasks, the data was richer and others, the data was really sparse. Um, for instance, hauling alfalfa, alfalfa and hay was based on a really little um, amount of data. Um, so that's the, how, where we got, how we pulled together the exposure, but what was the subject specific information that we had? Well. Each of the participants completed really detailed questions asking about their pesticide use and timing, 
but also the questionnaire had extensive um, questions about tasks related to bioaerosols. Um, and for each task, we had questions, you know, asking about the frequency of those tasks for different time windows that ranged from very recent, you know, yesterday or today versus the past week, the past month, and the past year. This figure shows you the prevalence of each of these tasks in our study cohort. The x-axis are the tasks in order from least um, on the left to highest um, prevalent task reported by the participants. And the prevalence is noted by the, the black circles. So you can see that poultry confinement was very rare in our study, but stored seed and grain, over 50% of our participants reported doing some activity related to that. The um, sort of orangey bars represent the median and interquartile range of the durations of activities. And what you can see here is that while these are all farmers in Iowa and North Carolina and often doing the same tasks, the length of time that they spend doing those tasks can vary tremendously. And so this was information we extracted directly from the questionnaires. And then we combined those two pieces of information to get a task-specific endotoxin score, where we multiplied the group averages from the meta-regression models for the task intensity by the subject-specific frequency from the questionnaire to get our task-specific score. And then we could sum all tasks to get a total score. This figure shows the exposure distribution of those resulting scores for the time window for the past 30 days. Um, in this time, the x-axis organized from the lowest median represented by the, the middle bar in each box through to the highest median um, from the left to the right. So our lowest scores were for moldy hay and cleaning other animal facilities um, that excludes the poultry and swine confinement. And then our highest median scores were for poultry confinement and swine confinement. And on the far right, we have our total endotoxin score. And what you can see by the boxes and the fact that they are, are fairly wide is that we have a lot of heterogeneity in our study population. And so that our scores are in fact, capturing exposure variability in our population. In the very bottom in the table, it lists the proportion of subjects that have a, a non-zero score for each of those tasks. So like from moldy hay, 20% of our population had a non-zero score. Um, for poultry confinement, only 1% of our population did that activity. So while it's a high score, it's not um, a, a large portion of our, our population. And swine confinement was 8% of our population. 71% um, of our population reported at least one of the 13 tasks and, we ha and had non-zero scores for endotoxin exposure in the last 30 days. So my next poll question for everyone was what tasks had the highest endotoxin concentration? Lisa just a heads up about the time. Yep. Uh, yep. I think I have three slides left. Awesome. I just ended the poll. Okay. So, um, 80% said swine poultry confinement, and that is correct. Cleaning grain brins was actually pretty close second. 
Um, Well, swine and poultry confinement was our highest exposed tasks. You know, once we considered um, both the exposure levels and the frequencies, we also found several tasks that had moderate to high endotoxin levels. So our next steps are to reevaluate re those previous associations that we saw with regards to number of animals as a surrogate and incorporate incorporate multiple sources of endotoxin exposure and see what we learn from you know, associations at that point. But that work is just new and ongoing. And I don't have that to share today. Okay. So looking back to the quote that really um, started my career in retrospective exposure assessment, you know, it, it still rings true. We're still troubleshooting and problem solving um, for different information sources, different modeling challenges and such. Um, every study is different and creates its own problems. But when looking back and for many examples that I've been um, working on that I haven't presented today, what I see is a set of common components that are despite their different study designs or their target analytes of interest. And that, you know, using these components and moving, you know, using all information we have available to us to move from our surrogate metrics to quantitative metrics is paying off in our ability to detect risks that would have otherwise be attenuated or even masked. Um, that includes targeted studies using company data, inspection data, published data. That includes asking subjects more for really detailed information on what they did and for how long. And bringing in experts to fill in the gaps and bring in context to both the measurements and to, to the, the responses by study subjects. And just as always, even small reductions in measurement error in an epidemiologic study can improve our ability to detect risks. So these are core lessons that I learned over my career um, in retrospective exposure assessment. And I wanna end just acknowledging that I have had the privilege to work with an extensive group of epidemiologists and exposure scientists who have done many of the groundbreaking work on this on which I've been able to kind of stand on their shoulders and, and, and continue on, um, you know, group at UBC and the BC Cancer Agency at Monash University and UC Berkeley and here at the National Cancer Institute. Um, at NCI, I'm the only PI doing this work, but I've been able to, um, over my, um, my career reached out to people like Noah Satius and Rule Vermeulen um, for um, advice. Um, and I've provided my email at the bottom. Please never hesitate to reach out to me if you ever have a question on retrospective exposure assessment and or if it really fascinates you, we always have thesis topics and um, postdoc opportunities, both on the exposure side and also on the epidemiologic side. With that, I will hand it back for Q&A.